Hello there and welcome back one last time for our discussion of PL SQL in chapter 7 of the advanced SQL course. All right. So uh, with the last video we have discussed a real major use case that tied together PL SQL and JSON and recursive uh, CTEs and so on. So all of these concepts play together in a quite elegant and nice fashion I would say. Uh, well, PL SQL really was a game changer in that it brought a established style of programming, imperative programming, to our discussion of SQL. Well, imperative programming is a style that many developers are well versed in. It's probably the style that they learn the first, that they exercise the most, that they have the most training in. And uh, seeing that PL SQL can bring this style of programming to relational programming is a real revelation. And uh, as I said, it's a real game changer. Uh, PL SQL is an imperative programming language that on top of that is tightly coupled with the RDBMS's data model, the type system or the available built-in operators and functions or the user-defined built-in uh, user-defined functions and types. All of this is available in PL SQL as well. So there cannot be a tighter integration of imperative programming into a relational database system. Uh, so you could ask yourself, why? Why would I ever consider to use, say, recursive CTEs to express complex computation? I would always resort to PL SQL to write code that is immediately understandable and follows established programming guidelines. Well, uh, to be honest, recursive CTEs are concise and elegant, but coming up with a functional CTE uh, sometimes can take a while and it certainly uh, uses um, some, uh, some training and some, uh, some, some, some experience there before you are well, really fluent in CTEs. Why not live in a PL SQL only world there? Well, uh, you could do that. And uh, I think it's uh, I think it's it's even viable. I think uh, that the majority majority of database applications on this planet uh, have some PL SQL uh, part to it, and uh, I would even say that this entire planet runs on PL SQL on a PL SQL basis. If would if you would switch off PL SQL systems in uh, uh, today, then I think this planet would grind to a halt. But still, there is some uh, some drawbacks to the usage of uh, PL SQL, and one such drawback amounts to a performance penalty that most of the PL SQL implementations uh, suffer from. And uh, I, I would briefly take the last few minutes of this course to have a closer look at this performance penalty. It's all due to our combined use of PL SQL and SQL and the use of SQL inside PL SQL UDFs, which leads to context switches. All right, so let's, let's look at the typical scenario. We would uh, write a SQL UDF here. That would be our SQL UDF, our PL SQL UDF indeed. As you can see here, language PLPG SQL, the Postgres variant of uh, PL SQL. And what you will find inside the body is a sequence of statements. So most of these statements are not interesting to us, so I have uh, just uh, abbreviated them here in a sense. Some of these statements will call out to embedded SQL expressions. So what you can see here is a scalar assignment, the evaluation of this particular SQL query that will yield a single row, single column table in this case. So, uh, well, putting this into parentheses will inter this as a scalar subquery, the result will be passed on to this PL SQL variable and we will continue processing on the PL SQL side of things before we reach the next assignment down here. Uh, in that next assignment, well, we will uh, assign the value computed by this particular embedded SQL expression to v2 before we return to PL SQL and then continue and then finally finish the evaluation of our UDF here. Uh, all of this is being invoked from the SQL level. So, uh, well, this would be the most simple SQL query I can think of that invokes our PL SQL UDF F. 
All right, so that would be the typical scenario that we have programmed in in the last few videos and that uh, PL SQL advocates for. But uh, what this actually leads to uh, is a context switch between the world of SQL and the world of PL SQL. And many of such context switches will be incurred. So we start down here when we use our SQL query to invoke function f. At this particular point in time, we are on the SQL level. This is the top level of our tiny SQL application here. We are at the SQL level. This should be query Q0, say. So we would start here at query Q0, and query Q0 would, of course, be evaluated by the system's SQL interpreter or a SQL plan evaluator. Uh, well, to fully evaluate Q0, we have to switch contexts to the PL SQL side of things because uh, we were invoking function f. So the interpreter, the PL SQL interpreter, which is a different piece of code, a different piece of code from the SQL based plan evaluator, the PL SQL interpreter will inter interpret the first few statements of our function f before it. Uh, reaches the assignment to variable v1 where some embedded SQL expression has to be performed and we would switch back the context to SQL evaluation to perform the plan evaluation for query q1 which would then return its result and bind it to variable v1 so that we can resume with PL SQL interpretation until we reach the assignment to variable v2 which will invoke plan evaluation for query q2 which will then pass its value back to PL SQL interpretation, which would then finalize the evaluation of our f function. And finally, we can return to the evaluation of q0 and uh, return the result from the SQL context of things. All right, so that would be a constant back and forth between the PL SQL and SQL worlds uh, as time progresses. Uh, well, you can imagine that uh, crossing the line here, going from SQL to PL SQL and back, is something that does not come for free. It's a context switch in the sense that different pieces or different parts of software have to be invoked inside the database system. Uh, well, this will of course affect the CPU instruction caches and data caches, entirely different pieces of code, entirely different pieces of data structures inside the system will now become. Uh, um, current when I perform a context switch from one side to the other. Uh, it also, it also uh, disrupts the plan evaluation here on the, on the SQL side of things. So we were busy evaluating plan zero, but then had to, had to, have, had to stop that, postpone that, and uh, change to PL SQL interpretation before we can later on resume the SQL on the SQL side of things. So that incurs, of course, uh, the need for saving state and resuming interpretation later on. All of this leads to friction and to context, context switch uh, costs that add up over time. For this particular very simple SQL query, this already looks uh, bad enough, but indeed it's actually much worse. So let's switch to the next slide where we uh, draw a more realistic picture of the uh, situation. <clears throat> okay, again, we are formulating a PL SQL UDFF here. And uh, well, we had a straight line UDFF in the previous example. Here we would uh, have a UDFF that uses one of the uh, well iterative constructs, a while loop, for example, inside its body. If one of the embedded expressions, for example, this embedded expression Q2 here, is actually located inside such an iteration, in such, in, in, inside such a while loop, well, then that uh, leads to even more context switches from the PO SQL to the SQL world. And it's even worse. If you look at how PL SQL functions are normally invoked in uh, in SQL queries, well, you would find their call sites in either the select clause or the where clauses in any predicate, actually in any expression that all could also be iterated during the evaluation of the top level query. So if you look at this particular top level query, it will bind row variable T to all the rows of this uh, source table T. And for each of these bindings, we will evaluate function F here. 
All right, F will receive the binding maybe, but it will lead to many invocations of uh, function f and each of these invocations will lead to the iteration of this particular while loop so this really paints a very desolate picture of context which is that we will suffer from if we evaluate this particular query and its udff well we would start of course on the sql side of things again with top level query q0 and then would switch over to the pl sql side of things to uh, to uh, uh, reach the first assignment to variable v1 at which time we would switch over to sql to evaluate the embedded query q1 once we've done that we return to the pl sql side of things to enter the while loop the while loop would execute in many iterations each of these iterations will probably lead to the evaluation of the embedded query q2 so that would be the first iteration back to pl sql the second iteration back to pl sql the third iteration back to PL SQL when we will leave the while loop finally and uh, then also reach the end of the function f so it's back to q0 to the top level query which will then produce the next binding for row variable t so that means we enter the PL SQL side of things again uh, to only to find that we have to re-evaluate q1 again and then have to re-evaluate q2 probably many times and all of this leads to a constant back and forth due to iteration inside and outside the UDF. And uh, this really, these contexts which is really add up over time to a significant uh, performance penalty that we suffer if we have SQL and PL SQL mixed in our applications. This is something to really consider. Well, the implementations of uh, uh, database systems try to alleviate that and accommodate for that by of, uh, by uh, compiling the embedded SQL queries inside of PL SQL UDF only once. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Emb embedded query like, uh, let me switch back here, an embedded query like the query Q1 here, well, it would be uh, planned and optimized once on the first encounter. When we first encounter this, this query Q1 here, it will be planned and optimized. And planning and optimization, of course, takes time. We would save the plan and we would save the optimization effort by caching that particular plan, maybe with holds, as we've discussed in a previous video, so that we can plug in the values of free variables that might occur in this particular piece of SQL code. But we would not replan and not re-optimize this uh, this particular uh, query again and again. Well, what we would have to do is still instantiate that plan with its holes all uh, all the times when we uh, encounter its evaluation. So while we do not have to repeat planning and optimization, we have to uh, perform plan instantiation, plugging in all the values of free variables into the uh, into the plan and then run the plan of course and then uh, once we have done that remove all the temporary data structures that have been built up uh, have to uh, have to deallocate um, uh, temporary resources all of this i would refer to as plan tier down here and this this of course hits the system every time every time we encounter one of these embedded queries so uh, there is some there is some effort in saving planning and optimization time here, of course, but still overhead for switching from PL SQL to the SQL world and then back again. That would be the part where we switch back to PL SQL when we tear down all the SQL plan uh, uh, resources. Uh, all of this will hit us uh, many, many, many times during all of these context switches. And indeed, if you look at the typical runtime profile, of a PostgreSQL um, application that runs and a PostgreSQL application that uses PL SQL as well as SQL bits in its implementation, then you will indeed find that, uh, well, almost 40% of the time in the typical applications that we measured here at University of Tübingen, almost 40% of the time of the overall runtime that we have to wait for the result of our application is actually spent in context switch overhead, in invoking the PL SQL interpreter, returning to the SQL world, returning from SQL to PL SQL again, all of this 
is uh, contributing to an overhead that can up to almost 30 40 so we saw figures between 25 and 40 or maybe even more than 20 40 percent here this is a significant fraction of time that the database system invests in performing these context switches all right so that's uh, a bit of bad news at the end of this particular course i don't know do not advocate against the use of peer sql quite the contrary it's a it's a wonderful tightly coupled and embedded uh, piece of software that allows you to express complex computation close to the database but you have to be aware of the uh, consequences regarding context switching overhead currently here in tübingen we are working on particular research that tries to reduce this uh, context switching overhead while automatically compiling peer sql code into recursive ctes but this is a topic for a completely different uh, diff different time this is not a topic of the advanced sql course which at this particular point comes to an end i would like to sincerely thank you for your interest and your participation throughout the entire semester which has been a tough semester i'm completely aware of, the, of, of that it has been tough for you guys it has been somewhat tough for me but i think we made the best out of the situation uh, the sun is setting at tatooine uh, that means this entire course comes to an end thank you folks uh, it has been an honor to uh, to teach the ins and outs of advanced sql here to you and i think and i hope that you can drive anything useful from that so uh, take care hope to see you live in the near future and uh, all the best